Well, good evening. It is July the 22nd, Thursday night at seven o'clock central, and we are here for Dome at Home. Nice to see you all there. Thanks for joining us. My name is Scott Young. I'll be your host for this evening. I'm the Planetarium Astronomer at the Manitoba Museum, and it's pretty exciting to uh, be able to be here. Uh, Mike is still on holidays, so I am flying solo, so please be gentle in the comments. Uh, they go by pretty quick, so I'll try and uh, keep track of them as we go through the show. We will uh, be able to answer a few questions at the end of the show, but uh, as we pointed out in our in our uh, summer season three kickoff, most of the questions, if there's something you really want to know, drop us an email. Or we'll put up the link shortly, and you can uh, or send us a message, and we can be prepared for the question. And uh, that just makes it easier for me while I'm trying to keep track of all of these things. Great to see so many people joining us. There are um, a number of folks that are popping in. Please, uh, please say hello in the comments. And uh, oh, we got a we got uh, Jasmina is here with a family of seven. That's fantastic. Nice to nice to see the whole family. We've we've actually got a number of really uh, touching letters and emails and comments from people that that say this is a sort of family activity for them, even if the family isn't all in the same place. They all watch the show at the same time and they chat back and forth and things like that. So that's pretty nice. That's that's kind of what we're trying to do here. This grew out of the COVID um, restrictions where we had to stay home and we were looking for things to do, but it really has sort of turned into a great family activity and, and bringing people together. The great thing is, as things get better, it looks like there will be the opportunity to get out in groups and do some observing. So we are looking at events coming up in August and into the fall where folks that are local to Winnipeg anyway will be able to join us live in a park somewhere and actually look at the sky together with other humans you know like we used to do anyway that uh, that'll be coming up but I'm really getting excited we're just starting to make plans for those now um, because it's been a long time since I've been able to see the people that I'm teaching astronomy to um, I've been doing this for a long time as a, as a individual but i gotta say staring at my basement wall with just a webcam in front of me i don't get that same level of uh of satisfaction back so that's why your emails and your comments and things are so important plus i get to show them to my boss justify them paying me so anyway okay let's let's get into our uh, program we have a lot of things going on space has been really busy the last week and is going to be really busy this week so we're going to take a look at our constellations and sort of the basics. We're going to focus tonight specifically on the cool stuff that's happening as the moon moves past the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Now that's still a late night kind of thing. It really doesn't get dark until late. So you do have to stay up late to, to see some of this. Of course, the elephant in the room, all of the smoke from the forest fires all across the country and across the continent have really interfered with um, you know, being able to see the stars. We had a couple of nights that were perfectly clear that we couldn't see anything just because there was so much smoke. So uh, our thoughts are definitely with the folks that are affected by those fires. And uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very um, obvious reminder of, of those issues that are going on all over the place. I know our friends out in, uh, out in BC, out in Northern Ontario uh, and Northern Manitoba are all, are all dealing with that. So take care folks. And um, it will clear and we will get a chance to get back to, you know, the fun stuff of just looking at the stars. The evening sky, like I say, doesn't come early enough, but if you wait for sun to set, you will eventually get to see the stars and the planets. We still have the planet Venus very, very low right after sunset. This is kind of what my view would be like. Actually, I have a few more trees that are being shown here, but by the time it's dark enough to see Venus, it is just on the horizon for me. And I have to walk to exactly the right spot on my street to sort of look between two neighbors' houses where they don't have a tree and, uh, and be able to spot it. Very, very bright and easy to see if there's nothing in the way. But if you have trees, it can be tough. So Venus has been um, you know, up there for a little while, but it's still kind of elusive this time around. Every year, as the planets all go around the sun, there are tilts that are involved here and certain times of the year when a planet becomes visible it's very low down because the, the tilt just happens to line up that it keeps it low for our part of the world our latitude because we've got 
around Earth that we live on. So depending on where you are there, that, that sort of changes your angle of how you see the sky. All of the planet's orbits are tilted relative to each other by a little bit. And depending on the season, our planet Earth is tilted over. And that also affects the angles that planets appear at. So all of these things have added up to make this not a great time for, for Venus. Right now, though, it's, uh, it's very, very low and will stay very, very low for the next couple of months. But try and get out there and, uh, and check it out. It is nice and bright. So as long as your horizon is, is clear, you should be able to spot it even through the bright sky and the haze and things like that. Mars is finally gone. It, it was uh, past Venus, uh, I guess, around the 12th and was heading down even farther. I never saw it even then. It was just too faint to see up against the bright sky. So that made it very, um, very difficult to, to spot. I know some people were able to see it in binoculars, and I've seen a lot of pictures that have uh, made things work. And uh, so, yeah. Oh, just saying hi to some of the, the folks here. Hi, Heather. Oh, hi, Melissa. Good to see you. I'm glad the family all got together. Hi, Rowan and Ryan and, and uh, the parents. Um, we got some great mail from, from Melissa out on the, on the West Coast and about, about the family. So they're, they're actually seeing the show together for the first time in the same place, which is pretty cool. Hi, Michelle. And uh, Janet is here. Lots of folks from Winnipeg, um, folks from Connecticut and, and so on. It's great to see you all here. Thanks. All right. If we wait for the sky to darken a little more, we get into our constellations. And this is, I mean, this is an 11 o'clock sky. It's finally dark enough to see stars. That's pretty much past my bedtime. So unless there's something big going on, I have not been staying up uh, as often as maybe I did when I was younger. But still, there's lots of things to look for. The Big Dipper, still quite easily visible. It's over in the Northwest and it's actually, oh, let's pull this down a little bit here. It's actually sort of lined up so that the Dipper itself Oh, did we lose things? Let's just see all this is working. Oh, I think we're all good. Okay. Um, the Big Dipper uh, actually looks like the Big Dipper. It's sort of right side up and, and very easy to spot at this time of the year. So that makes it pretty uh, convenient. The arced handle, the curved handle of the Dipper, you can follow the arc to the bright star Arcturus. And Arcturus is in the constellation of Boates. I'm just going to pull this down even a little bit more. Boates is supposedly a herdsman, but to me, it's the ice cream cone here with a big blob of ice cream on top. That's been a, a very common feature of my summer with the summer heat that we've had. Swinging around to the southern sky, the, constellation, the constellations of summer are up. We have, uh, actually, let me just zoom out just a little bit here so we can see a little more of a wider field. There we go. Our summer triangle is high in the southeast by the time this, the uh, stars get dark enough to see, and it passes almost directly overhead over the course of the evening. So easy to find those three really bright stars that make the, uh, the summer triangle, each one in its own constellation. This is Vega in the constellation of Lyra the Harp. Oh, there we go. Deneb over here in the Northern Cross, or Cygnus the Swan is the official designation. And then way down here, Altair, flanked by a little fainter star on either side. That's how you can always tell it's Altair. In Aquila the E, but I think last week we talked about it looking kind of more like a stingray with a long tail. Again, down low to the horizon, we have other objects in the solar system. This is the moon over here. It's, it doesn't show its shape when we're zoomed out this far, but it's, uh, it's pretty much um, almost a full moon at this point. And then two bright objects over here, there's Saturn and there's Jupiter. We'll take a closer look at them. They're rising around, oh, 10.30 now, um, but they stay pretty low. I mean, if you want the, your best view, you probably wanna wait till 11.30 or, or even 12 before they're up above the, the haze of the horizon. If you have a pair of binoculars, Jupiter will show some of its moons. Up to four of the moons are big enough to see in binoculars. Unfortunately, the rings of Saturn do require a telescope and a little bit of practice to, uh, to sort of zoom into it, but um, definitely a great view. We'll be watching uh, Saturn particularly over the summer and uh, we'll make sure we get some 
telescope session set up with that because it is truly one of the jewels of the solar system. Way over in the east, we already have the fall constellations rising. And I know it's terrible to think about fall in the third week of July, but it definitely is the kind of thing that uh, we can see ahead. Um, now we're getting a, a couple of little dropouts there. Sorry about that. Not sure why that is, but that's happening to me too. Hopefully it's just a frame or two here or there. So in the east, we have the great square of Pegasus rising. This is supposed to be a picture of a horse with wings. Well, these extra stars here, I think this is the tip of its nose. This is sort of its head. This is its neck. These are the wings. And these stars make the front legs um, and they don't draw the rest of the horse for some reason. These other stars over here are actually part of Andromeda, the princess. I really don't know what people were thinking about when they were looking at these constellations. I mean, they were naming them in honor of, of characters from their stories, but you can't just add stars to make good pictures, right? You, you've got to work with what you're, what you're left with. And I'm sure there was a lot of competition for, uh, you know, whose favorite constellation or whose favorite god or goddess got the best stars that were up there. So to me, I really ignore those mythological things. I still use the names because those are what the names are, but I've basically learned that the word Pegasus for me doesn't mean flying horse, it means a square of stars. You can find your own way to, uh, to put these together. We've also got uh, Queen Cassiopeia over here or the W shape. And at this time of the year, again, the, the W shape is sort of right side up. So it makes it quite easy to spot. And the other constellations that we've uh, talked about in the past, King Cepheus is, uh, is just right up here, this little faint house of stars. And then we've come all the way back around to the, to the north and the northwest. And right in the north, of course, the north star right there, the one star that hasn't moved throughout our entire run of the show so far, six months and uh, seven months, I guess. And uh, it's basically stayed in that same spot as the whole sky slowly revolves around it. So the constellations, like I say, those are things that change slow enough that if, if they don't get out for the next week or so, they're still gonna be there largely in the same spot. They do slowly change. And of course, everything in the sky slowly moves around as the, the stars rise and set and so on. But spend a little time under the stars, you'll get to know those motions and, and start to sort of understand how the motions um, affect what you're gonna be able to see. It just takes a little bit of practice. The more time you spend under the stars, the more intuitive everything becomes. And uh, you stop sort of being overwhelmed by, oh, there's so many dots or, oh, I can't see a picture of a queen. And you start to just observe the sky as it is and get to know it. And, uh, and that will really come very quickly as, uh, as you do, do spend a lot of time under the stars. Okay, um, we have a few other stories that we're covering right now. And uh, one of them, of course, shameless plug, the museum galleries and the planetarium will be open August the 5th. Our schedule is already up on uh, our website, manitobamuseum.ca. We'll be running three shows a day, Thursdays through Sundays. So we won't be open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. And uh, that'll be our summer schedule. And then in September, we'll have more schedules based partly on what other restrictions might change from COVID and also um, depending on demand. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that we're opening the hours that people want to come and make sure we have enough programs for people. Right now we have a, sort of a kids show planned that's aimed at uh, you know the family. We've got the sky show which is sort of your classic planetarium constellations and planets and stars kind of program and then we've got our feature show uh, which right now is called Ice Worlds and it takes a look at all the planets in our and planets and moons in our solar system that have ice on them and compares them to the earth and and looks at you know, all the differences and similarities there. That's a really cool show. Huh, cool, I see what I did there, that was good. Um, usually Mike would make that pun for me, but alas, I had to fill in for him. Oh, hello, George. George is crawling around here, my cat. Here, come on up. Hey, Georgie. We haven't seen George live for a while. He doesn't like coming downstairs, but uh, he's decided to come and join us. Ratings always go up when George is on the program, I have to say, he's the most requested topic that we get. 
Hey, church. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you go down there. That was a nice little treat. All right. Oh, we've got uh, our crew from Thompson watching. Hi, Maria. Nice to see you. And uh, Pascali. Oh, you're. Um, oh, that's great. You've got uh, the whole crew there. This is great. Lots of people uh, together for the show. Okay. So, like I say, the planetarium and the museum galleries are opening. If you haven't been by the museum for a while, there's actually a bunch of new galleries that have opened in the last like year, year and a half. But of course, most people haven't noticed because we've been closed for a big portion of that. So there's the new Prairies Gallery, which is the uh, the old old Grasslands Gallery that has the TP in it. That whole space has been completely renovated. Still have the TP, but lots of really cool new exhibits and new areas of Manitoba fe being featured. Lots of great stuff. There's also um, the orientation gallery where the buffalo um, diorama at the front is. That area has been redone, but again, the buffalo is still there. And uh, there, the, the discovery room has been redone. There's just so many changes if you haven't been there. Um, and so it's been, uh, it's been a long haul for us to sort of design and build these galleries one by one. If we could have just if we knew COVID was coming, we probably could have just clo closed everything down and did it all at once. But that wasn't that wasn't the way it worked. So this is this is a long project that's been going on for many years, and so it's great to see it finally open and and available to for people to see. So come check it out. And of course, uh, the, the Manitoba Museum and the Planetarium were a not-for-profit uh, charitable organization, which means we depend on ticket sales to keep us going. So uh, if you like this show, please uh, come and visit us and buy a ticket or uh, something like that, and uh, it'll ensure that they get to keep paying me. Okay. Shameless plug over. Now, we've, um, we've often get uh, questions. Our, our website has a lot of great astronomy information on it, but it's not right on the front. Page. And so um, this is what our website looks like. And if you click over to the planetarium section, you get a picture like this and way down on the left there's a menu of items and uh, one of those options is the current night sky down at the bottom left there there's also astronomy resources which are some of the activities that we've done here on dome at home some of the activities that we do for schools and for camps and things like that are all available for you to download and play around with um, we have planetarium courses and seminars where we'll teach people how to choose their first telescope and things like that. anyway all of that stuff is on the website and um, we also do a monthly column. So basically a lot of the content that you'll see on Dome at Home is all available to you as a reference. If you forget something or missed it or whatever, you don't have to fast forward and rewind uh, through, the, through the, the, the program to be able to find it. Just go on the website and all the material is there. There's a calendar of events and uh, some of the same images and things like that. So use the website and uh, that'll provide you with a little bit more um, information in between shows. If there's something you'd like to see on the website that would help you as a budding astronomer, as a backyard explorer, uh, drop us a line and uh, we'll see what we can do because uh, I'd like to add a little bit more content to the, to the website as well. Okay, our feature topic, Jupiter, Saturn and the moon. As you know, we live on a planet, the earth, which is round, yes it is, and it goes around the sun. And there are other planets like Jupiter and Saturn and Mars and all those that all go around the sun and they go at different speeds and so on. Then there's the moon that goes around the earth. It's much closer to us. So the moon whips around the sky very quickly. It goes around the sky in about 28 days or so. Whereas the planets take much, much longer to move through the stars. Because of that, sometimes things pass each other from our point of view. And remember, it's not just the planets that are moving. It's also us that is moving that helps get these things into, into alignment. So you'll hear big things about planetary alignments or conjunctions is the other term that's sometimes used. Not a big deal, really. It happens all the time, but it's a kind of a cool thing to watch because you've got more than one object at a time. So coming up, I've got these times set for around midnight and we're looking off towards the southeastern part of the sky. And I picked midnight because that's when Jupiter and Saturn are up high enough to be kind of visible. So here we are on the the night of the 22nd, morning of the 23rd. And we have Jupiter over here, the bright, uh, brightest star-like object in the sky. We have Saturn over here, a little fainter. This little um, 
faint triangle of stars here is called Capricorn. So if you're a Capricorn, that's uh, this is supposed to be a half goat, half fish, which is exactly what I see when I look at those stars. And then here we have the moon. So it starts out on the, the morning of the 23rd with the moon sort of off to one side. And then as the, um, as the night goes on, those things will all rise and set and disappear. And then the next night when things rise, the moon will have moved over here. So kind of in between the two planets. This would make a nice photo op if you're out there with your camera because uh, you got the two planets which are nice and bright. You got the moon in between. And uh, the moon's pretty much full at this point. And then the morning of the 25th, the moon is right underneath Jupiter. These are the nights where we get a lot of calls or emails saying, hey, what was that bright star next to the moon last night? So now you are the experts and you can tell all your friends what that bright star next to the moon was. And uh, so it'll be Jupiter on the morning of the, the night of the 24th, morning of the 25th. And uh, that's probably the closest approach of this particular set of, uh, of conjunctions. And it's just kind of coincidence that it happens to be there rather than over here or over here or whatever. There's, there's quite a bit of flexibility where the moon could be on a given night, but it just has to do with pretty much the time zone that we're in and what we can see. So if you're out west, actually the moon will be a little bit farther to the left, maybe two or three moon diameters to the left at the same time. So Melissa out in, out in uh, the west coast, the moon will be slightly farther left for you. And of course, if you live in a place that is either farther north or south from uh, southern Manitoba, that changes your angle a lot. If you're farther south, these objects will be nice and high up in your sky. Most of the great pictures that we're seeing of Saturn and Jupiter right now are actually coming from people down in, you know, Texas or New Mexico or Arizona, places where the sky is dry and clear and these planets are nice and high in the sky. The last night of the sequence that we, that we bothered putting here was uh, the night of the 25th, morning of the 26th, because the moon is sort of still forming a nice broken line with, with the two of them. They're nicely spaced out. So that'll still be a distinctive thing that people will notice in the sky. And uh, so you'll be able to watch that over the, over the course of the four, uh, four different um, mornings. Hopefully, again, we'll get some clear sky. The moon will continue to move on and it'll just be farther and farther away. Um, after about the morning of the 26th, you sort of lose that sense of them being together. You notice that Jupiter and Saturn haven't moved very much at all. I mean, they have moved a little bit. If we just go back to, uh, if we just go back a couple of things, you'll see that Jupiter is slowly moving night to night, a tiny little bit between, um, between nights, but it's such a small amount even in binoculars, you'd have a hard time sort of noticing that. Okay, let me see our, our uh, comments here. Sorry, things are just flying by. I just saw a whole bunch of things all catch up. Great. Okay, lots of, uh, lots of comments for, of people uh, excited to visit the planetarium and the, and the science gallery. Uh, uh, sorry, the museum. The science gallery, sorry, is not reopening right now because the science gallery, um, it's so hands-on. And one of the requirements right now for museums to reopen is that they close off any of their hands-on exhibits. And so that would be closing off pretty much everything. So the science gallery, that's still staying closed. We're, we're looking for ways to, to get that going, but it'll really require um, some, uh, some changes to, uh, you know, the, the way that the, the restrictions work. Um, lots of really, uh, lots of really good comments. Um, looks like, uh, let's see. Oh, Daniela said uh, on Facebook here, um, your son has got a, uh, a telescope for his birthday, July birthday, yeah. And the sun stays bright, so you can't really use your telescope. I know it's tough. One thing you can do, if you look on your calendar for um, the, well, I guess we're past first quarter now. If you look on your calendar past the um, um, first quarter, the first quarter moon is visible in the sky during the daytime. And actually so is around last quarter. So around last quarter moon, if you um, get up early, you know, in the morning, 
the moon will still be visible over in the west while the sun is rising over in the east. So make sure you don't point your telescope at the sun, but at least you can look at the moon during the day and be able to spot that as assuming the smoke clears and things like that. Um, so yeah, that'll be, uh, that'll be a way to at least get some telescope viewing going until you know September, October when the sun sets early enough and uh, sets you know, before bedtime. I know it can be tough to stay up really late when you're, uh, when you've got sort of the, the really, really late sunsets that we have in our summer. So this is Saturn and it is a, uh, a beautiful planet to see in a telescope. This is a picture that I took a few, uh, a number of years ago through just a backyard telescope. Um, and that's pretty much what it looks like. I mean, on a nice a steady night, you can see the rings of Saturn. You can see the cloud bands on a really, really good night. If you have, uh, if you've done some practicing with your telescope, you can even see more than one ring. It's a pretty impressive sight. And I could look at Saturn for hours and hours. It's just, it's just so beautiful. Pictures really don't convey what, uh, what the magic of actually seeing it live is. Jupiter is a little bit easier to see some of the stuff. There are stripes that go across it. All those clouds of Jupiter are, are visible in different colors. The great red spot that everybody's all uh, has heard of, it's actually kind of the not so great pale orange spot. It's this tiny little thing right there. And because Jupiter rotates every just under 10 hours, most of the time it's not on a side facing us, so we can't see it. So the great red spot, people often expect to see that it's not really that big of a deal. Um, you have to catch it at the right time. And even then you really need good um, steady views to be able to see it. With, with Jupiter down so low from Southern Manitoba, with all the turbulence in the air that we're looking through and stuff like that, we might not be able to see things like the great red spot very well at all. But the moons of Jupiter are easy to see. You can catch those in binoculars and uh, a small telescope shows them really, really well. There's four of them that can be seen in binoculars or small telescopes and they orbit around Jupiter. So um, basically they move back and forth. Um, sometimes they'll pass in front of the planet, which makes them hard to see. Sometimes they'll pass behind the planet and disappear. So here we only have three of them because the fourth one is in behind Jupiter somewhere. So that's a pretty cool thing to, to see. And they change every time that you look at them. So Jupiter never sort of gets old. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, we have had a whole bunch of busy things going on in space, so I think it's time for a little... Cool Space Stuff! So the Hubble Space Telescope was broken about a month ago. Not actually broken, but the computer went down and it basically had to turn itself off to make sure it didn't cause any f future problems. There were problems with the computer, then there were problems with the backup computer, there were all sorts of issues. Scientists at NASA and the Space Telescope Science Institute and, and uh, all the folks there have been working really hard. It came back online. They switched over some components and to be honest, I'm not an electrical engineer so I didn't understand all the details, but they basically rerouted the power um, kind of like they do in Star Trek and managed to get away that everything was working properly. And so these are some of the new images from Hubble. These are some of the galaxies that it routinely would take pictures of. There's a couple of colliding galaxies on the left there. And uh, so you've got these galaxies that probably looked like the one on the right originally. And as they get close to each other, the gravity just stretches them all out of, of shape and they wind up in these, these really exotic shapes. In the very center of those, in the, there's a sort of a bright spot that's not a physical spot. That's just a really dense concentration of stars. And in the center of those concentrations is almost certainly a supermassive black hole that is basically the residue of a bunch of stars that have all died. The stars in the center of a galaxy, often quite big and quite bright, they burn very fast. They run out of fuel. They collapse or explode in a supernova explosion. And sometimes if conditions are right, that can form a black hole, which is one of those really mysterious objects that uh, you know, everybody wants to know about, but they're, they're kind of mind bending. They, they don't really seem to follow the laws of physics that you and I are used to. I mean, they do follow the, the real laws of physics like Einstein and so on, but that's not the kind of stuff that makes sense on an earthly scale. 
you know, the gravity works pretty obviously for you and me. If I throw a ball, it's going to fall and it'll hit the ground. But gravity gets pretty complicated when you get to gigantic um, scales and very close distances and so on. And so black holes are a complicated topic, but they're super interesting. So we're going to be taking a look at black holes throughout the summer um, in August. We're going to try and take a look at that. And the other thing is that black holes show up in popular media in sci-fi all over the place. You know, people use black holes to slingshot around things or to go back in time or to travel to other universes or all that kind of stuff. Is that real? Is that logical ex, uh, extrapolation? Is that baloney? Well, we'll get into that. Um, so that'll be a future show in, uh, in August. That'll be fun. And it all comes from, you know, our understanding of the universe, which is brought to us by amazing things like the Hubble Space Telescope. I mean, Hubble really has done amazing work. It's without a doubt the most successful scientific instrument of all time. It's, it's got so many major discoveries and also just so many um, images that have spawned all sorts of other theories and stuff like that. It's, it's really, really done amazing work, especially given that when they launched it, it didn't work properly and had to be repaired and it's been upgraded and so on. And now they've brought it back from the brink of, of uh, shutdown. So pretty exciting. Yay, Hubble. All right. You probably saw the, the billionaire space race. Uh, last week, we talked about Richard Branson's flight. This week, uh, we can talk about uh, Jeff Bezos's flight. He went up in his Blue Origin rocket. He and his brother and uh, Wally Funk, who was one of the Mercury 13, the, the 13 female astronauts that were selected by NASA back in the 60s, none of them ever got to fly because they decided, nope, girls can't do this. Ridiculous. Well, anyway, sh she was on board. She's 82 and uh, is now the oldest person to have been in space. And then the youngest person to have been in space was the fourth person. He was um, an 18 year old, um, guy from the Netherlands, I think it was, who uh, is well off and could afford to buy the ticket, basically. 11-minute um, flight up, a few minutes of weightlessness down, up past the 100-kilometer limit that is the definition of space, so they definitely did go into space, and then parachute down. I think it would be an awesome flight. I mean, they got to float around in the cabin for three minutes or so of, of microgravity. They got to see the curvature of the Earth, seeing the Earth from space. Um, I'm not sure that I would have paid the $28 million that uh, the ticket cost the, the, the guy to be on the first flight. But, you know, prices will come down, perhaps. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting um, um, beginning to commercial space flight. You've got a couple of companies already competing, and um, hopefully that means that you know, space travel won't be too far down the road for some of us. Um, although it would be nice to be able to do something sort of productive with it rather than just sort of joy rides. Um, if it's just a theme park kind of ride, maybe that's not as, as uh, cool as something else. But anyway, I'm following it and, uh, you know, I'd love to go into space. Let us know if you would, uh, if you had the opportunity, if money wasn't an object, would you, uh, would you do one of these trips up into space just to get a few minutes of, uh, of floating in space and seeing the Earth? Let us know in the chat. Another launch took place. This is the Nauka um, module of the International Space Station. Nauka means science in Russian, and it was launched on a proton rocket and is now in orbit around the Earth, and it's playing catch up with the International Space Station. It'll take a few days of sort of looping around to catch up, and then it will dock with the International Space Station um, coming up in, in a few days. Nauka has been long overdue. It was supposed to launch in 2015, but all sorts of delays happened and things like that. So the International Space Station, as you probably know, it's got all these bits and bobs and, and areas where you can stick on other spacecraft. So right now there's four spacecraft stuck on. There's uh, the Dragon spacecraft over here up on top. There's the, the Soyuz here, That's, those two carry people. And so those are sort of the lifeboats that they have in case something goes wrong and they all have to come home. And then there's two Progress spacecraft. These are automated cargo machines, basically like, I don't know, like FedEx delivery vans pretty much. And they come up every six months or so and they provide a whole bunch of supplies, oxygen, fuel, water, fresh fruit, 
uh, scientific experiments, all that kind of stuff. They generally dock to these little spots here. These are the docking modules. And uh, so the one on the bottom, this here is called Piers, and it's been up there since 2001 and it's past its warranty date. So it's getting ready to be retired. And so what's actually gonna happen coming up on Saturday is that the Progress spacecraft that's attached to it, normally it would detach from the, the Piers module and then float away and go back to Earth and it would burn up in the, on re-entry. Well, this time it's actually not gonna detach from Piers, it's gonna take Piers along and Piers will be detached from the space station. So this whole section, basically the Progress plus the Piers docking compartment will come off the space station, go into the uh, atmosphere and it will burn up uh, over the Pacific Ocean in the middle of nowhere because Piers is a pretty solid module. Some of it will survive re-entry and they'd rather it didn't fall on someone's head. So it's gonna be in the middle of the ocean so that any pieces will just you know, sink to the bottom of the ocean. That will free up the spot where the Nauka module is gonna dock. So that's gonna happen on, uh, let's see, that's happening Thursday, July 29th. The Nauka module will arrive and basically take the place of Piers. It's about three times as big as peers and it's got a whole bunch of it's got a european robotic arm on it it's got its own solar panels it's got a um a second space toilet big deal for the international space station crew of seven sometimes a crew of ten one bathroom some of you can relate to what i'm talking about so lots of uh lots of great stuff for the space station there so that'll be kind of cool the space station is currently visible from southern manitoba um if you go to our website that we have the predictions on there, but basically each night there's one or two passes um, in the middle of the night that are visible. The Nauka spacecraft, as it catches up to the International Space Station should also be visible um, in similar times. They haven't yet posted the predictions for it. I'm not quite sure why, but we should be able to, uh, to get those up on the website. And then you'd be able to sort of see these night after night as they would get closer together depending on how the timing works out, we might even see the progress in the Piers spacecraft when they detach. So it'll be kind of cool to see all of these spaceships sort of doing this little cosmic dance as they reconfigure for, uh, for the future space station. I'm gonna be watching for that. Of course, it'll probably be cloudy or whatever, but you never know, maybe we'll get some clear skies. Finally, at the end of the month, we have one more launch. This is the Boeing Starliner spacecraft. It's basically, like the, the Dragon spacecraft that SpaceX has launched. It's designed to carry astronauts to the International Space Station, and it's designed to do all sorts of other things. It basically looks like the old Apollo uh, spacecraft, pretty clear lineage there. And um, it has an uncrewed or an unmanned test flight. Um, so just robots on board, it'll go up on the 30th, and um, sorry, on the, on the, yeah, on the 30th, which is Friday, uh, not tomorrow, but next week. And then on the Saturday, it will dock with the International Space Station. So a whole bunch of spacecraft juggling around there. So that'll be kind of cool to watch. I'm looking forward to seeing um, some of these things in the sky. I mean, the space station is really bright. Nauka will be pretty bright as well because it's quite large. The other ones, the Progress and, and uh, Piers docking compartment, and then the, uh, the uh, Starliner here won't be as bright and we'll have to see what the uh, what the passes are if we get any good ones over over Manitoba. Sometimes they come right overhead. Sometimes it's just low along the horizon, and it'll be different each night, different time each night. So if you want to go, um, the best the best website that I use is uh, heavensabove.com, which is uh, a wonderful satellite tracking and astronomy website. They'll they'll uh, basically you put in your location, and it does custom. Uh, predictions for all the satellites you can see. So definitely worth checking out. We have a link to that on the Manitoba Museum webpage as well. That's sort of our go-to site for, for satellite information. Let's see. Um, we're gonna, oh, we have, uh, we have some questions here. Um, Genevieve is asking, um, how old do you have to be to be in a spaceship? You know what? So far, the youngest person to go into space just went up this week. Um, and he was 18. Most astronauts are in their late 30s, 40s, 50s that go up into space. And then the oldest person also went up this week, 
was uh, Wally Funk. She was 82. But I think as things become more available, eventually there's going to be, someone's going to realize kids in space will be a thing. And, uh, you know, I, I think it would be really cool, really inspiring for, you know, kids down here to see a 12 year old kid in space doing something, doing experiments or teaching or something like that. I think that would be so cool. So I have hope that we'll see even younger people in space. Um, looks like the consensus is uh, most people would go into space, which is fantastic. Um, I certainly would if I had the, uh, if I had the cash. Um, oh, I missed a question uh, back here about uh, black holes. Uh, Val is asking, is there a black hole at the center of our galaxy? Yes, there is. We think that there's a black hole at the center of pretty much every galaxy. Um, and that's just a consequence of how black holes get made. Black holes are basically the leftovers from massive stars. So any place you have a lot of massive stars, you're gonna wind up with black holes. And so in the center of galaxies, that's the densest place where there are stars. The, the, the gravity just sort of it pulls things towards the center and the stars are very massive there. They burn out um, very quickly. And if they form black holes, probably what happens is the black holes spiral into each other and sort of absorb into one super massive black hole. And so you probably don't have a, a bunch of black holes. You probably just have one super massive one. Now, contrary to what people may think, black holes don't suck things in. They don't, they, they're not like a vacuum cleaner. They're just a gravitational source like anything else. Like a, if you have a star the size of the sun, and then you had a black hole that had the same mass as the sun, the gravity would be the same until you got really, really close. You'd have to be like very, very close to the black hole before the gravity starts to change. And once you did, then the gravity would change very, very quickly. So if there's a black hole in the center of our galaxy, we don't have to worry because it's the same as if there were stars there. It's far enough away from us that it doesn't have any different effect on us. It's only when you get really, really close. So, I mean, once we're flying around the, uh, the um, universe and you know flying into the center of galaxies and stuff like that, then we'll have to watch out. But from our point of view here on Earth, black holes, not a threat at all. I see Melissa has posted our astronomy resources link up there too. Uh, thanks very much, Melissa. That's, uh, that's great. That'll help people find that very easily. And um, Michelle is asks, asks uh, can I ask if my cat would like to go into space? There are days, you know, particularly at three in the morning when I get the pat, pat, pat on my face uh, that I would like to send George into space. But uh, apparently it's not an option. I'm not allowed to do that. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think, uh, I don't know that I'd send him into space necessarily. I'd pro I'll probably keep him around. If anybody's going to space, I think it's gonna be me. Okay, uh, coming up next week, we will be looking at, uh, well, some of those launches that we talked about that are happening in the future will have occurred and we'll be able to sort of catch up on all of those. Uh, hopefully we'll get some footage of the Nauka space module and uh, some images of the space station going over and stuff like that. So that'll be fun. And uh, hopefully we'll have pictures of the various conjunctions that we talked about today. Remember, you can find all of our cool stuff on the uh, Manitoba Museum website. You can send us um, messages through Facebook. Um, you can hit us up on the YouTube channel. And of course, our email space at Manitoba Museum dot ca that uh, that's the place to send any questions if there's something that you'd really like us to cover please drop us a line and we'll uh, we'll incorporate it into the show and uh, try and cover it off for you thanks for joining me it's great to see all of you and uh, i look forward to being able to do this again next week try and uh, get out under the sky um, and uh, hopefully again the smoke will will uh, fade away a little bit as the fires get under control and we'll be able to see the stars. Have a great week and have some clear skies. Good night.